All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I know some folks are still dropping in here. I'm gonna go ahead and do a quick orientation before we get started. Um, many of you have been with us for a couple weeks now, uh, so welcome back. Just as a reminder, this session is being recorded um, and it will be shared on our organization websites. Um, it's also going to be streamed on Facebook Live, so if you'd like to share it with folks who are maybe not registered, but um, who you think might be interested, you can hop on and share that as well. As a reminder, you're all on mute and we can't see you, so you can move around, do whatever you need to do as you listen. Um, you can submit questions through the Q&A box, um, or you can submit them via the chat panel, um, which we are going to collect and uh, save for um, our panelists to respond to in the future. We're not likely to have time for answering those questions here today. Um, if you are here live, you are already registered for our remaining sessions. You can use the same link, the same Zoom ID um, for all of our panels. And if you're viewing the recording and you haven't registered, um, you can do so at this um, short link that's shown on the screen. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Talia and she will. Yeah, to air relatives. Hello. Thank you, Neek. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening once again. Uh, before we get started, I want us all to take a moment to acknowledge wherever you may be tuning in from that you are on Native land. So please take a moment to, to acknowledge that. She a Talia Boyd and she told each eat me and she to a hey cleaning, but she's cheating. I should a shade or to a bar had a shanala had out in that essentially. Before we get started, I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists for this evening. We have Joseph Brewer, Dr. Joseph Brewer, who is an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and an affiliate of the Oglala Lakota Nation of Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Brewer is an Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and Director of Indigenous Studies Program at the University of Kansas. He works with Indigenous peoples on issues related to natural resources, management and stewardship, energy sovereignty and self-determination, the federally recognized Tribal Extension Program, land tenor, and local regional Indigenous knowledge info that informs state, federal, natural resource management agencies. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Brewer. We also have Dr. Kelsey Dale John, who is an assistant professor of gender and women's and American Indian studies at the University of Arizona. Her work is on horse and human relationships and creating educational and research spaces that center non-human knowledge. She also works on indigenous methodologies, indigenous feminisms, and organizes an annual horse conference on Navajo Nation. Thank you for joining us, Dr. John. We also would like to welcome Chris Stainbrook. He is Oglala Lakota and is the president of the Indian Land Tenor Foundation based in Little Canada, Minnesota for the foundation's initial 16 years with the mission of putting Indian land, lands in Indian hands. ILTF has a staff of nine and owns a for-profit subsidiary, the, land, the Indian Land Capital Company. Prior to this position, Stainbrook held several positions with Northwest Area Foundation, ending his 12-year stay at the Community Activities Lead. While, a Northwest Air, while at Northwest Area Foundation, Stainbrook managed grant-making programs in sustainable development, natural resource management, economic development and basic human needs. He has served on the boards of the St. Paul and Minnesota Community Foundations, Grotto Foundation and is currently a board member of the U.S. Endowment of Forests and Communities. Prior to his work in philanthropy, Stainbrook has worked with a number of Pacific Northwest tribes and Alaskan Native villages to develop businesses and manage their natural resources. He has directly participated in the creation and development of tribal businesses, ranging from small check cashing firms to a multi-million dollar retail gas and oil company. Stainbrook assisted several tribes in undertaking land use and land acquisition planning. He also worked in the fishery as a biologist for the Confederated, Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. Stainbrook has owned and operated several small, successful small businesses on his own. Welcome, Mr. Stainbrook. Uh, 
Thank you. The guy can't hold a job. Uh, I would also like to state before we get our dialogue started um, that we are speaking as individual tribal members and not on behalf of any of our tribes or any tribes. Uh, we are sharing our perspectives as Native peoples who have experience working with many tribes and many tribal communities, including various governmental entities and organizations. So let's go ahead and get started with our dialogue. Uh, tonight, we will be discussing Native land rights, land co-management, including uh, articulating human and animal relationships with the land. Um, but before we get started, I would like to pro provide a little bit of historical background on the General Allotment Act of, of 1887, um, also known as the Dawes Act. Divide, this divided American Indian treaty lands into individually owned parcels of land known as allotments. Under the General Allotment Act, Indian allottees were declared incompetent to handle their land affairs and the, US, the United States would retain legal title to the land as trustee for the allottee. Indian allottees had only had uh, beneficial title in other words, as long as, in other words, as long as the allotment was held in trust by the federal government, the Indian landholder could use the land but not sell it or lease it without the federal government's approval. Upon the passing of the original allottees, ownership was and has continued to be distributed among their heirs as undivided interests. Any undivided interest in allotted land is held in trust by the United States for the, ben the benefit of its Indian owner. Individually owned trust and restricted lands are not subject to any type of city, county, state, or federal taxes, such as property taxes. Most financial institutions do not accept undivided interest in trust lands as collateral for loan. The idea of owning land was, is foreign for Native peoples. Those are the white man's way of thinking. Native peoples know that there has to be a critical consciousness of our relationship with the land, and we ask ourselves, how, how does one own the land? The Dawes Act and all federal policies used for the purposeful, are used for the purposeful removal, disconnection, and dispossession of Native homelands. The government deemed Natives, again, incompetent to handle our own lands. I wanted to provide a little bit of historical background. Um, before we get into our questions, uh, some of our questions will be um, based around, around that historical background. So let's go ahead and get started with our questions. And for this first question, I would like to direct it to Mr. Steinbrook. How does the BIA manage tribal land, especially when the BIA budget for land management is not enough? I guess the uh, answer to that is not very well, right? <laughs> um, that's the short answer. Let me give you a little longer answer. And, and But before I start, let me also say that um, a thank you to the organizers for having me on the panel. It's always good to do these and, and save me a trip to any number of places by being able to talk with this many folks, and not have to fly there. Um, the other thing I would say is I think it was Samuel Clements that once said, no generalization is worth a damn, not even this one. And what happens is if I talk about um, a tribe and their situation and the Bureau's treatment of that tribe, um, there you have to keep in mind there are about 560 some tribes across the country with different histories and different backgrounds and different lands and different processes that have involved those lands. And so it gets pretty hard to just do a blanket declaration. But I, I will say um, in the Bureau of Indian Affairs Defense, they um, have always been short budgeted. And so it's not like this is necessarily a unique situation under this administration because many of the positions that would be involved in land management have not been filled at the at the DC level or even at the regional levels and there have been cutbacks and so the management by the Bureau of 
individual and tribal trust land has gotten to be uh, more and more scant as we've gone along. And I do think that's one important thing to keep in mind is that there's tribal trust land, tribal restricted fee land, and also tribal fee land. And there's the individual owner, individual Indian owner lands that are trust lands. And so those two um, combined with the Department of Interior's uh, trust responsibility to the American taxpayer creates this kind of unholy triumvirate of trust, if you will. So they're looking out for the American taxpayer and at the same time, they're supposed to be looking out for the tribes and at the same time, they're supposed to be looking out for individual Indian owners. And what you'll oftentimes find is that those three have very different um, perspectives and, and the benefits accrue differently to each of those three entities. And, and they're in conflict a fair bit of time. The tribes want land back for the tribal ownership, individuals for if housing, farming, ranching, businesses also would like more land. And so the foundation that I work for, we try and bridge those three pieces as best we can in a way that um, results in Indian people, whether it's, the, whether it's tribe or individual Indian people, have more land and we don't lose more land. And it seems every time there's a process in DC to make management easier for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, we as Indian people and the tribes, we end up losing on the losing end of that regulation or new legislation. Um, the other uh, thing I would say is that um, a few years ago, in fact, back in 1996, a woman by the name of Eloise Cabell filed the largest class action suit ever filed against the federal government. And that was for an accounting of individual Indian money accounts. And this is something that well, many Indian people are quite aware of, but um, non-Indians aren't. So the land generates revenue if it's leased or if timber's cut or if um, you know, oil or gas is pumped out of it. And those revenues go through a whole process of being, it goes to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and it goes from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to the Department of Treasury who cuts a check. And a lot of people used to say, oh, every Indian gets a government check. Well, that was their money coming back to them on their land. It was revenue from their land. And over time, the process you described with the original LAT passing is the Dawes Act didn't have a, a good methodology for dividing um, among the heirs of the deceased LAT the property. And, and so they configured one that said the title would divide, but not the land. And so um, if you had an original LAT with four children, and a spouse, the spouse would get one half of it and the children would divide equally the other half. And that was in place for many years and many generations. And over time, that's become this um, onerous piece of growing work that just kept mushrooming to the point where um, part of the settlement with the Cabell suit was to help reduce the number of undivided interests in land. Now how, how divided are they? Let me give you a couple of just quick examples. The smallest undivided interest that I've ever seen in, um, in person on a trust document is one over 32 million. So this person owned one over 32 million of 160 acres. Essentially, just over an inch and a half square. And, and you know, that's, you, we, we as Indian people and owners of land have become disconnected because who's going to really be interested in their one over 32 million, right? We have properties now um, with as many as eight or 10,000 owners on them. There'll be 160 acres with 8,000 owners. Um, 
for Indian people to manage that. Imagine yourself sitting down at one of the feast days and you've got, let's say even 2000 of your closest relatives and you're gonna talk about managing 160 acres somewhere. I mean, not an easy conversation basically. The other, the other part is we've had intermarriages and other pieces and so people own trust interests on different reservations. We have, we got some information from the Department of Interior. We got their database and the largest interest holder is a woman, 45 year old woman. We don't know where she's from, but she has 240 interests on six different reservations. If you collectively add up the equivalent acres she owns, it's less than 100 acres. And so each of those interests has to be managed by the department. And so, the, you know, in, in fairness to the BIA, they're saddled with um, things that Congress did to Indian land a number of years ago. I think one other thing I would like to say about management of Indian land and and the Bureau. The Bureau of Indian Affairs actually is um, tasked with protecting treaty rights on off-reservation lands. And, and it's just not the Department of Interior. As trustee, the U.S. government is the trustee. And so protecting treaty rights and treaty resources really falls to every department in the, in the U.S. government. USDA, uh, all of its bureaus, the Department of Interior and all of its bureaus, the Department of Treasury and Commerce and the work that they do, they're all trustees. And so when you talk about kind of common management off of reservations, um, there's the argument has been made and in the Pacific Northwest was made that there needs to be co-management on a lot of those resources. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. That is a lot of great insight for sharing that. <clears throat> I want to move on to our next question, and this one is for Dr. Burr. Uh, Dr. Burr, can you distinguish for us what laws or policies uh, tribes utilize that support tribal sovereignty? Um, and for instance, I, I, what is a tr traditional cultural property and how is it used in land protection? So again, like uh, to echo what uh, Mr. Stringbrook said earlier, it's, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here and um, you know talking about these important topics. Um, so I'm going to give you uh, a document at the end or via email that you can post with this with this talk, so folks can access more of these resources because. Um, there's just a ton of resources out there. There's a ton of laws, there's a ton of policies, uh, a ton of court cases um, and treaties that individuals and tribal members uh, and tribes can refer to your question. So uh, specifically about the um, tribal culture or the traditional culture, cultural property, um, basically it's a designation under the uh, National Historic Preservation Act of 1962 as amended in uh, 1992 to, to basically it's a program to preserve historic um, historic properties is what it is and uh, tribes can participate in this process um, and so um, to place tribal properties or historic sites that don't necessarily have to be within reservation lands they can be in federal lands, uh, they can be in other lands under the National Registry, which, you know, if that does take place, if, tr if the uh, traditional cultural property is recognized and um, it is placed under the registry, it basically brings to bear the full um, regulatory practices and legal practices of the federal government over those locations and it brings consultation and and uh, co-management, as uh, Mr. Stainbrook said earlier, to bear as well. Now, when I say consultation and co-management, I also mean, um, you know, the agency, whatever agency that might be, if it's National Parks under the DOI, 
if it's U.S. forestry, if it's fish and wildlife, it's the Bureau of Land Management, um, to consult with the tribe as an equal entity. And the idea of consultation and the idea of co-management um, is, you know, essentially two sovereigns coming together to manage a space um, on equal footing. And so um, that's essentially what that means. Though there are numerous uh, acts and policies, just to read a few, Tribal um, uh, Forest Protection Act, uh, 2004 National Environmental Policy Act, 1970, uh, American Indian Religious Freedom Act, 1978. Um, Religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act, Tribal Self-Governance Act. So a lot of these acts have some kind of implication in regards to uh, this idea of co-management um, of, of lands. And then of course, looking at treaties, you know, what tribes sign treaties reserving particular rights or rights that were not abrogated or taken away from them. Um, what si tribes sign treaties to reserve rights on specific lands that might be outside of their reservation uh, via the Bolt decision, um, i.e. Um, and so those rights are reserved on those lands to hunt and fish and gather uh, as they always have. Um, so uh, this idea of traditional homelands of tribal nations expands much further than the uh, reservation boundaries that you see on a on a present day map of the United States today, um, and so a lot of the agencies that tribes work with in regards to um, steward these lands, um, you know, National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, as I stated before, um, you know, have working relationships sometimes with tribes. Sometimes those are great relationships and sometimes they're not so great relationships. Um, and then almost everything in between. But I will say, as, as Mr. Stainbrook pointed out earlier and, and then in your first question, is that some of these agencies are underfunded. Um, and it's hard for, you know, it's hard for an underfunded agencies to, you know, provide full services to, to the protection of tribal lands. Um, but there's a long, there's a long uh, story to this in regards to the protection of sacred places, sacred sites, sacred lands, uh, traditional tribal homelands. And so um, designating these lands, like the ultimate um, goal, of course, as um, Indian Land Tenure Foundation, uh, Mr. Steinberg mentioned earlier, is to get you know, Indian lands and Indian hands or, or have some kind of a protective status over those lands, protective designation over those lands. If it's a protected land use designation or a protected, just a flat out protected land uh, designation, i.e. The, the traditional cultural property. So um, there's just a lot going on there, you know? And uh, as uh, I don't mean to generalize, um, but just to kind of put that, you know, put that umbrella up and kind of give a broad perspective of what a traditional um, cultural property is and, and how that kind of shoots off into other areas and, um, of interest in relation to um, land management or coal management, or the, to back to the question. So I'll leave it there and hopefully we'll have some discussion around that at some point. Yes, absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. Um, there, are, there are several federal policies um, that the tribes can utilize and um, it, it's definitely uh, something to navigate. It takes time, it takes that research and really kind of digging in and wrapping your head around it. Um, but it's definitely food for thought and stuff that our tribes need to be aware of um, as far as um, practicing our tribal sovereignty. Let's go ahead and move on to Dr. John. Um, I would like to ask you a question. How do theoretical location theories like settler, settler colonialism, indigenous feminist theory, indigenous studies help us understand centering knowledge, indigenous knowledge systems for ancestral homelands? Uh, yeah, uh, Kelsey John, you know, yeah. 
Bilagana Edashima, Tlasche Ebashis Chin, Bilagana Edashi Che, Bitane Edashinali, at Isnas Pastinasha. Hi, everyone. Um, just happy to be here. I'm Bene, so we always got to share our clans uh, before we speak. So I am honored to be a part of this conversation. And I just want to thank uh, Chris and Joseph for sharing before me um, some of the policies and frameworks that we're dealing with here. So I work in um, a highly theoretical field, uh, but we also try to work to bring these theories into practice. And so your question is, how do concepts like settler colonialism or even indigenous feminism, indigenous studies help us to understand um, what we're talking about here, which is tribal consultation and indigenous knowledge for land management. And I think um, I'm really glad that you brought up the Dawes Act in the beginning to give some context because this is a perfect example of settler colonialism. So settler colonialism is essentially a theory that's been um, kind of carved out and communicated by indigenous folks to sort of explain the underlying assumptions, epistemologies that really make these policies come into practice. And so really what settler colonialism is saying is it's kind of painting this broad brush strokes of how we might understand oppression and erasure of indigenous folks in this space on, this, on the North American continent and in relationship to the US government. So um, there's lots of different faucets of it, but I think one good example is the Dawes Act. And so, um, Chris, you mentioned that there's one person who had one and 32 millionth of a portion of land. That's a perfect example of settler colonialism in practice, which is erasing indigenous folks off of land and in turn erasing their relationship and presence with that land. Um, and so settler colonialism kind of becomes this theory that we can always go back to to articulate, hey, this is happening again. Indigenous folks are being pushed aside. Their ideas are not recognized or they're not framed as valid, maybe as scientific um, or as something that's, that's relevant for land management practices. Um, the second kind of theoretical location that I navigate is indigenous feminisms. Um, and this is really deeply important for understanding relationships to both land and non-human animals because lots of tribes um, understand their relationship and presence with land through systems of gender and family and kinship that are not traditional heteronormative heteropatriarchal systems in which the institutions that now provide policies for us are modeled off of. So one good example of this for the Nef folks is that um, in the Navajo worldview, it's a matriarchal matrilineal society, which means that women are major like power holders, uh, both economically and politically. And specifically, women were the caretakers of livestock, of animals and of land. So as grazing policies and um, policies to manage animals and manage land come into play, they transfer that ownership from female to male ownership. And you can only imagine what that does socially and economically to a society that has always been organized around women as the caretakers and relationship makers of those relationships. Um, and so it really kind of throws a wrench, not just in the relationship to land, but also in the economic processes of the community, the family interactions in the community. It kind of, if you want to, indigenous feminists say, you know, if you want to like really mess things up in a community, then you switch around understandings of gender and family. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. And I think American Indian studies Indigenous studies, um, as it's kind of moving toward that name now, that intersection now, really helps to collect a lot of what, you know, the ideas that we've been echoing here, which is that um, there are different ideas of personhood, right? There are ideas um, and relationships to land that come from a totally different worldview. And so that has been American Indian studies major intervention in academic 
and scholarly and community spaces is like, hey, there's a different worldview that indigenous folks have. And so they do things differently. Um, one of my favorite quotes for this is Vine Deloria Jr. Um, has this famous quote where he says, the biggest difference between a Western worldview and a native worldview is that native folks believe that everything in the world is alive, that everything has autonomy, it, it's, it has personhood, it has relationality, it can communicate with you from the plants to the animals to the horses, I'm all about the horses. Um, and so that matters in your knowledge systems and in your consultation processes um, as you manage spaces and relationships. Absolutely. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Dr. John. That was excellent. Um, I want to move back to Mr. Stainbrook. And this goes back to um, undivided interests. How do undivided interests and fractionated titles diminish land rights? And how can Native peoples manage their land assets better? Well, it, I mean, the diminishment really happened when the Dawes Act took place because, I mean, um, once they did the blanket declaration of all Indian people and the tribes incompetent to handle their own affairs and took the land into trust, basically the federal government became the owner of the land and Indian people were, um, they could have the beneficial use, but all actions on um, those trust lands needed to go through the approval of the Secretary of the Interior. Um, in essence, and, and you really have to go and examine the Dawes Act for what the underlying intention was. And if I can, let me see if I can share my screen and I'll show you um, if I can find it. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. There's, oh, here it is. So this is Teddy Roosevelt in his inaugural address in 19, or 1901. And it, it basically lays out what the intention was. And that's to um, have the General Allotment Act as a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass. And if you, the reason they were interested in breaking up the tribes, basically all the treaties were with the tribes and the executive orders were with the tribes. And so what you saw in the reservations were guarantees of land for the exclusive use and occupation by Indian people. And not only did they want to grab more land, but they wanted to really end the treaties. And the only way they could do that was to basically get rid of the tribes and have Indian people become um, general citizens or not. At that time, they weren't even thinking of Indian people as general citizens of the United States. And so um, it was a way of ending some of the, the treaty rights and obligations of the federal government. The, you know, today, um, what we're seeing is a number of tribes have been moving toward getting Indian people um, back in more more serious control of what they call the bundle of rights of tra of land ownership. Um, but it really wrestles with kind of the underlying uh, mentality of Indian people in some ways. So um, when we do landowner trainings, oftentimes people will say, but they're violating our treaty rights by taking our land, our individual land. The treaty never guaranteed Indian people as individuals land. It guaranteed the tribe land and, and a reserve. And so you have to, I mean, and I tell people this, I was born a socialist and trained a capitalist and, um, I think back to if you look at if you look at some of the First Nations in Canada, some of them this is a nation, and we own the land underneath the the basic 
fundamental jurisdiction of our nation. And we can have Indian people living on it. We could sell it to non-Indians if we want. We could tax non-Indians and Indian people if we want. But we need to act like a nation with underlying jurisdiction. And in some ways, I would hope that we would get to a point in Indian country, and we push for this whenever we can, where in fact, the tribes are sovereign. They don't have to ask the Secretary of Interior for permission to even sell their land if that's what they'd like to do, as long as they maintain that underlying ownership. Going into a trust process, a fee to trust process, if a, if a tribe or individual Indian person buys a, a piece of fee land from a non-Indian, they could hold that in fee status and then enjoy the entire bundle of rights. So they could lease it at their own will, they could sell it, they could farm it, they could put a house on it, whatever is allowed under the code. But under the current situation, they would then be under county and state jurisdiction in most instances. And so that's why Indian people tend to put their land into trust even today. We'd rather, and this is what we're what we'd like to push for is to see them have uh, tribal nation status for their land. And so any individual Indian person or the tribe buys a piece of ground, it immediately goes into tribal nation status and we don't mess with the trust relationship any longer. Um, there are those who would say, well, geez, Chris, if we do that, we're we're moving toward termination, which of course um, is a is a onerous thing in Indian country. Um, for those uh, people who were old enough to remember the 50s, the late 1950s, we had 121 tribes declared no longer tribes, and Indian people no longer Indian people. Um, even some of the two of the most successful tribes, the Menominee and the Klamath tribe out of Southern Oregon um, were terminated and lost their status. So there's that fear, but at the same time, I think we as Indian people need to say, let's move to where we were. Um, and, and, and kind of Dr. John was talking about breaking that kind of settler, mentality that's what got us here they wanted us to be farmers and ranchers on land that wasn't going to support a farm or a ranch um, and we need to break that and move on and and regain our our rights on our land thank you chris <clears throat> thank you um let's go ahead and move uh, back to Dr. Brewer. How can Native peoples, um, well first let me back up, many many times uh, knowledge sharing goes against ethics of a tribe or even tribal communities um, because some of our knowledge is, is sacred, our traditional knowledge, and it can't be shared. Um, can you explain to us how can Native peoples protect our traditional knowledge from exploitation? Sure, yeah, that's a that's a good question. So let me back up really quickly, really quickly here. Um, in regards to land, um, trying to understand. So my most of my career and actually most of my life has really been trying to understand that connection that Native people, my own tribal people, and the people that raised me have to land, um, and understanding that connection, understanding that really deep spatial and temporal. Um, relationship has uh you know it's a lifelong kind of a deal uh, because that knowledge is so deeply embedded into landscape your identity as an indigenous person a lot of times um, is embedded um, my experiences is embedded in place and so language words within language um, are in direct relationship to to place um, I've been working in, uh, um, doing some work in Alaska for the last few years and, and looking at uh, ethnoforestry uh, up there and working with some Kuchin elders 
on you know identifying tree species and things like that for better management practices better stewardship practices and and uh one of the more humbling things that i've experienced throughout this process is um the varying phrases and words that are associated with one species of tree um writing you can write books sometimes you know on on one species and understanding that deep relationship goes back to understanding also that again spatial and temporal um time spent in a place over time um it's just phenomenal it's just amazing and so that knowledge that uh you know tribes maintain over the course of millennia um of a place and when i say of a place i don't again i'm not going back to i'm not looking i'm not thinking of a map a common current map in my mind of reservation boundary i'm thinking of traditional homelands of tribal peoples and so thinking of that knowledge um how do tribes then protect it um in this age um we've all seen and witnessed exploitation of uh tribal knowledges over time um you know if we look at uh, plant plant knowledge and things like that and how that's been exploited for native people here in north america over time and how that's uh you know gone into monetary monetary uses outside of outside of tribal um i guess jurisdiction outside of tribal um knowledge i guess of knowledge of tribal peoples knowing where some of that plant knowledge or ethnobotanical knowledge went to and other people may have benefited from outside of the tribes so um what i'm seeing what i'm experiencing is that tribal governments are actually passing ordinances and codes on their own institutional review boards at the tribal level and so individuals wanting to do research and this just serves as an example individuals um from outside or inside the tribe wanting to do research with the tribe that requires um some kind of adherence or some kind of um connection to tribal knowledges um you know have to go through irb boards and tribal irb boards sometimes are very different than university irb boards um and that's for this specific purpose so um tribal knowledges don't get exploited don't get taken advantage of um tribes creating these codes and ordinances is an expression of sovereignty uh in their homelands to go beyond that you know some tribes will state anything produced within these reservation uh the, the jurisdiction the reservation you know is first and foremost our property and before a researcher publishes or takes that data outside a reservation uh we're going to sign an agreement to say what you can and can't do with that data and and we're going to have you know we're going to sign potentially um knowledge bearers of the tribe to work with you in that process and identifying other knowledge bearers in our community that you can work with um and these are just examples and you know some folks are going as far as to say you know once that data once that knowledge once that research leaves our reservation boundary we have the right to that information even though it's left you know our reservation boundary that's ours um and so which is you know which is created for some researchers kind of a you know like a um alarm bells uh, but there's ways to work through that and so that's one way that's one example those are some examples of ways that tribes are working to protect their knowledge bases one of my colleagues and myself went through a um a litany of laws and policies to try if we can see if we can track down a law a policy that um actually protects tribal knowledge uh in the ways that we're talking about and we were hard pressed to find anything to be honest with you so um so the need is there to protect those knowledges um i think the desire in a lot of ways is there as well to protect those knowledges uh, from tribal communities and one way to start is you know looking inward at the tribe and how are we setting ourselves up uh, infrastructural capacity wise to to look at um how how we're protecting ourselves this idea of harm 
you know, how can our knowledge, sometimes that leads our reservation communities, how can that be used to harm us even? Um, and so there's a lot of examples there as well. Uh, a lot of examples, a lot of court cases where uh, misinformation has been presented as fact of tribes from studies from the, you know, early 1900s that were inaccurate. Um, but anyhow, leave it there. Sorry, a little long winded. No worries. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Dale, um, I would like to segue over to you. How did the construction of Western grazing systems impact tribal communities? And where does the rhetoric in the media on horses, wild horses, characterized as problems originate from? Yeah, there's so much here. Um, I'll try to summarize as, as best as I can. So I think, you know, what I'll start with is that my work has always been like in relationship and sort of in awe of horses. Um, and the reason for that is that um, I feel like a lot of what we're saying here is kind of pointing to the, the, the policies, the practices, whether it's research, whether it's uh, exploitation, and we sort of see what happens to the land also happens to the people of that land. Um, whether that's breaking it up or like dismantling the relationship um, or extracting resources, right? Extracting resources from the land, extracting resources from the people and in, in the form of knowledge. Um, but then I also think that to kind of add on another level to that, it also happens to the other persons of the land. Um, so for, you know, many indigenous communities and my own included, the way that I was taught is that these animal persons are persons too, right? And so all of this autonomy comes to them as well, just inherently. Um, and so that has kind of been my, uh, where I try to do my work, I guess, is to think about how we can build frameworks that also like ask animals, right? Relate with animals about what they say about this conversation. So um, that being said, the system of grazing um, as it has been set up is a narrative that, and I like to think of things in terms of narratives, even like policy stories, is a narrative that really starts with like um, colonial contact, right? And so this idea of grazing as we understand it now then becomes embedded in this like land theft and then the setting up in the protection of rights of like basically ranchers who are taking indigenous lands and using them to ranch and profit. So then they become regulated in things like the Taylor Grazing Act, right, which tries to do conservation and preserve these spaces. Um, but something that is totally like foreign in this concept as it intersects with indigenous worldviews is the idea of private property, right, or even of leased property. Um, the idea of ranching from one perspective. So there's lots of Native American ranchers, right? We were always doing agriculture. We just weren't doing it in the way that the policy protected and provided for. And so grazing rights is a really good example of that. Um, and I think too, to take it even further, a lot of conservation efforts think really heavily about land, but not always about like land, human person, animal person relationships all simultaneously and together. And not just like who benefits and who decides who benefits, but also like who has consultation within that process. And so it's sort of like a convoluted strange thing, right? But it's something that indigenous communities have been doing forever. We've always been learning from animals. We've always been learning from the land. We've always been in communication. You know, every indigenous origin story, like animals are talking to us. They're helping us. They're teaching us. There's this back and forth. There's treaties that are made between human persons and animal persons, right? And so thinking in that term of sort of bringing animals into this realm of personhood, I think is deeply important. And so when you think about animals as persons, and then you think about the rhetoric of 
free range horses or wild horses, which there's a lot of connotation around the world wild, right? Like, you know, there's wild Indians, there's wild horses, like um, kind of coming from the same place, right? The sort of dehumanizing space and this idea that there's a kind of perfect idea of domesticity. Maybe that's a settler, you know, agricultural type of idea. Maybe it's a really well-behaved woman, right? Domestic. And then there's the wild, which is the kind of antithesis of that. And so we see that then overlaid on these horse persons. And so something that I've always known and always advocated for is that we have to remember that horses originated on the North American continent. They were actually here before a lot of humans were here, right? Or they're here with us in our stories that we tell about where we came from and how we got here. Um, I know they're in the net creation stories, they're in other tribal creation stories. And so to think about the management and the characterization of wild horses as problems, um, or as being in the way to some form of grazing or um, some form of conservation that's ideal, I think views it from a really narrow perspective that starts at colonial contact rather than looking at, hey, there's been species in this area who have been here forever. Um, and so I'll never forget, there was a High Country News article that says, Navajo Nation has a wild horse problem. Um, and I read that and I remember thinking, this is really problematic because when I think horse problem, I immediately go to Indian problem. Um, and it was Andrew Jackson's administration that said, we've got an, Indi an Indian problem, right? And essentially that problem is that there's Indian folks and they're in the way of what we want to do, right? Of how we want to extract resources or the land that we want to have or, you know, the systems that we want to perpetuate. And so I think it's really important that when we talk about how to best keep the land and the animals healthy, that we don't resort to rhetorics that were used to dehumanize people to then dehumanize animals. Um, and I think even further to look at a bigger picture in terms of, of conservation, land management, natural resource management, um, that looks at like the larger structure. So in policies that are like promoted to deal with, uh, deal with this horse problem, a lot of times it's horse slaughter um, or it's forced removal. And it's like, these, these seem really familiar, right? Like, how is this happening? again um, to our ancestors. And so it makes me ask the question, why is it that we live in a structure where the only way to create healthy relationships is to forcibly remove persons or to slaughter them? And I think that's a better question to kind of ask when we think about how controversial like the wild horse debate gets both on public lands and on tribal lands as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And grazing is one of those topics that comes up over and over again when, it, when we talk about land management, especially within public lands. And so it's really important for us to, um, you know, start having those dialogues and really start articulating what it means for Indigenous peoples. And I, I love everything that you said and shared with us. Thank you so much. Um, so we do, I, we do have a little bit of time and I want to go ahead and, and try to answer at least one question um, from the audience. And I'm going to go ahead and pull it from the chat box. And let's see, I'll just start from the top. This is from Daisy Morgan. It says, since the Forest Service is under Department of Agriculture, do they differ from the Department of Interior with respect to relationships with Native people? What could improve this relationship if it's strained, assuming it is? And any one of you are welcome to answer. Well, I can answer from the standpoint of being part of the federal government. They're also um, a trustee for the tribes and the Indian people. Um, and and they, they don't interact as often as the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but at the same time, um, many of the resources that are treaty right resources are on Forest Service land. And some of the tribes have developed 
and some of the Indian landowners have developed good working relationships with the Forest Service and other USDA programs. And I would say maybe because there isn't quite as long a history as there, or history coming out of the War Department for USDA, um, they tend to be um, more amenable to working with the tribes than, than a lot of the, the folks at the Bureau. But they, they share that trust responsibility and that needs to be pushed with them. Yeah. Absolutely. And so um, even now today, you know, current day with all the fires in California, uh, there are a number of tribes in California that um, have a relationship with US Forest, US Forest Service, uh, as Mr. Steinbrook was stating. And, um, you know, some of those relationships are really good. And, and, and uh, some of that relationship details specifically tribal practices in regards to getting rid of or alleviating excess fuel on the forest floors, um, just as an example. They just don't have enough rakes, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, yeah. You know, tell you if I could, if I could say something, the um, in in listening to both Dr. Brewer and Dr. John, uh, I think both both of them highlight kind of the yin and yang that we're in because of um, how, do, how do we keep our culture, how do we keep our knowledge, and at the same time, um, try and get the rest of this country to recognize some of that knowledge and use it, and not, not exploit it, but use it. Um, and I mean, Dr. Brewer and I come from a tribe that tried to assimilate Europeans when they came. They tried for almost 150 years. Finally, there were just too many Europeans. We couldn't assimilate them all. Um, and, and yet, you know, you get to a point and you say, well, all right, where's that line between exploitation and um, using the knowledge that, that, that we, would, we would and could provide to them? When I was at Warm Springs, the Forest Service wanted to cut a big piece of timber right on the edge of the reservation boundary. And our culture committee at, at Warm Springs just about lost their mind because it was one of the few places with old enough timber that the black moss that was important at root piece was growing on the trees. And you had to get to about 50 to 60 years in order to get that that moss to grow. And it, you know, and, and the people at the Forest Service just didn't understand that at all. You know, they had no idea anyone even used the black moss from the trees. And so it's a matter of how do you get that out there, but at the same time, um, don't get exploited in doing it. And it's that, and the, and the tribes right now are going through the yin and yang thing with the, with the wild horse problem, right? Um, you've got Yakima that has way too many horses to even be supported on the land they have available. And what is that, how, how then do they have the conversation about how do we get back to something that's more realistic? Yes, absolutely. And so before we end our session here, we do have about one more minute. Um, I want to share a, a uh, quote from um, a, a tribal elder. There is an ancient Indian saying that something lives only as long as the last person who remembers it. My people may ha have come to trust memory over history. Memory like fire is radiant and immutable, while history serves only those who seek to control it. Those who douse the flame of memory in order to put out the dangerous fire of truth. Beware these men, <clears throat> for they are dangerous themselves and unwise. Their false history is written in the blood of those who, who might remember and those who seek truth. This is Floyd Red Crow Westerman, Dakota Sioux. Thank you all so much, panelists, and for everybody who tuned in tonight. <laughs> we deeply appreciate it, and I welcome you to come back next Thursday to welcome more Native experts as we dive into how to visit on with respect on ancestral land.
Yeah, thank you, panelists, and everybody have a good evening. Take care.